If you are a person like me, who has dreamt of travel and has a hobby of exploring this world, pushing their comfort zones and seeing everything there is to worth seeing, then career is going to get in your way. But what if I told you that you can balance the two out? I have chosen the path of being a software engineer and I have laid the foundation to be able to travel frequently and work full time in a way that I care about my full time job and it is important to me. I make meaningful contributions, but I can still pursue my hobby of seeing the world. If you want to know how, I'm going to share everything I know with you in this video. Not everyone has to be a software engineer to enjoy this lifestyle. But one thing I want to make it clear is if you have a remote friendly job, then you can start paving the foundation yourself to be able to be in the same position that I have worked myself into. When I was young, my first job, my first career was actually a behavioral therapist. I was in line to move towards being a psychologist, which I don't know, explain some things in my life, who knows. But, and my mom had always told me I should do computer science. And she thinks that the computer science is gonna go far and I'll do well at it. I told her that I don't want a desk job, so that's why I'm doing a behavioral therapist, which honestly is not a desk job. You're working with people all the time and you're having face-to-face -face interactions and it's a good job and it's a good career. If you're a behavioral therapist, shout out to you. I understand how hard the job is. Ultimately, vacation was more of an afterthought for most of the people in this career field and having lucrative time off was not really a thing. So I eventually realized if I'm going to achieve being able to do more with my life and be able to travel the way I want, follow those passions I wanted to, then well, I'm either going to have to YOLO quit my job and become a full-time content creator, which wasn't really a big thing back then, or I'm going to find a job that I can work remotely. So I went back to school. I ultimately got that computer science degree. I became a software engineer and I paved the way. Now, it's important to know when I was early in my career, I was really focused on my career, being that I wanted to be as best as I could be as a software engineer. There are lots of things as an engineer, any engineer can recognize that there's continuous things you have to learn. There is no unsurmountable amount of technologies and things you'll have to learn through your career to keep up and make yourself marketable in this industry. Learning how to learn fast is actually a great skill to perfect early on. And once you can learn fast, you can pick up things fast and be able to add value virtually to any team you'll be able to work on. And over time, adding that value will help build experience and confidence. But I can't, I'm not going to get too deep. I've been thinking about making a video of, of how I learn and my methodology behind that. If you would like me to, I can make a video on it. Let me know in the comments down below, but I'm going to skim through it right now. The important thing that I want to communicate here is that career is important. It's, you will spend a great amount of your life on it. And there's pros and cons versus, you know, an individual who decides to own their own business, be a contractor. There's pros and cons to all these different ways. And despite what you might hear on YouTube or other people saying, there is no best way to go. They all have pros and cons. Having a career provides stability. If you want to have a decent, well-rounded life, you can still get a high paying job, have a career and have the flexibility to travel. And that's why I want to really communicate and reach out to you in this video. And early on in my career and up till now, I spent a lot of time investing into myself to build certain skills and attributes and hammer them in almost as instincts to become a great engineer, to be the best I could be and challenge others to be better and contribute to a greater whole. In retrospect, going back, I would spend lots of time working for my employer, probably 80 to 100 hours a week, which I would not recommend on anyone. And honestly, a lot of people burn out with that style, but I was always investing into myself. If I were to go back and tell myself wisdom of things I've learned, I would say, don't look at it as working 100 hours. Look at it as working 40 hours for your employer. And I really advise putting time caps of how much you invest into your employer because your employer is always going to pay. There's a certain deal that you enter in with your employer. 40 hours for a lot of people is a lot of hours. And some people say that's more than a healthy society should be working. But with that said, 
That's the deal we have in U.S. When you have a job, 40 hours. That's the deal, unless you're asking for overtime, and that's a separate deal. But with that said, most employers are asking you to work 40 hours. If you give them more time, an employer's gonna say, yes, please, I'll take it. That's why you won't be rewarded for that. It's not necessarily a part of the deal. There are bonuses and such, which I'm not gonna talk about optimizing all those things, but if you look at the details of those bonuses, they're not going to scale with the amount of hours you're putting in. So it is actually better to work the amount of hours in your deal than is to put in overtime and expect to be rewarded for it. What I'd like you to frame and keep in your mind is I'm going to work 40 hours and then I'm going to take an extra 10 or 20 hours and those are going to be investments into myself to build skills, not for my employer, but to improve myself. And that could be extracurricular learning. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to improve my fitness. It could be, I'm going to learn a new programming language. It could be, I'm going to write a tech blog and practice learning something new. It could be a wide variety of things. But what's important is those things are going to push your comfort zones and force you to learn other things. It could be also, my employer asked me to do something I'm not entirely sure how to do, but I'm up for the challenge. So I'm going to spend an extra 10 hours, not necessarily working, but I'm gonna study the thing because I want to know that technology better so that I am going to be a better engineer and not necessarily working for your employer. So what's important is framing the mind that you're investing into yourself to become a better version of you. And the better you are, the more value you'll be able to provide within the 40 hours you're going to do. And this is going to prevent that burnout, that feeling of burnout, and also allow you to make more money and eventually more flexibility. As I approached my mid-career, I got a lot more flexibility. And I started using that flexibility to travel a little bit with my wife. And over the years, I found that, hey, my employer, the people I know, as long as they communicate, I'm open with them, and they're comfortable with the amount of value I'm providing to the team, then I get a little bit of flexibility. Of course, they have to trust me. They have to know the amount of work I can provide. If you're a person who jumps around jobs, it's going to be a little bit hard to build that amount of trust. But if you are able to get into a team where you do have a good trust-based relationship and you do consistently execute and provide an immense value of your team, no one's going to question where you're working because the amount of value basically says everything needs to be said about your value to the company. So focus on being a high value individual. Make sure you're accustomed to keeping your work hours too restricted to the deal that you're expected with and try to ink more value and build skills to be able to do more with that time versus give more time to your employer. It's a better investment and it makes you more valuable individual. And ultimately, this is going to give you the money you need for travel because travel is expensive. Unless you are someone who likes to budget travel, it's a different type of experience. I am someone who I don't travel luxury. That is beyond my budget. And I wouldn't be able to travel as much as I do. I usually travel at the midpoint. Being not super cheap, you know, it's not it's not cheap, but it's also not expensive. If you were to look at the budget ends, probably right on the average, and it has good ratings for the average. So I would say some nice place in the midpoint. And this has allowed me to travel quite a bit and see some amazing things and enjoy a lot of things. I will say I'm not a solo traveler. Since I've started traveling, I've been almost always with my wife and we enjoy traveling together. We're each other's best friends. And so I also would advise find some good travel companions, find a group, find a good social group that you can travel with. If you enjoy solo travel, power to you. I know it burns a lot of people out and people shouldn't be pressured to do solo travel, but I do know, I do recognize that some people enjoy it. Anyways, I digress. Travel should always be enjoyable and make sure you find some like-minded individuals that can travel with you in a way where you can work at the same time. 
So it helps to find other people who have a similar mind to travel and work at the same time. So let's talk about that next. Being that everyone should treat their job seriously. And with that, you're now trying to explore how to travel more and travel with others and enjoy. Traveling can be a scary thing. And it honestly will put you to the test because traveling while working is harder than just working and it's also harder than just traveling. You mix the two and it's gonna be more stressful, but you build some systems, you try it out. And in fact, I have a video that talks about this, so I won't go over any of the details on this. If you're interested, check out that video. I'll link it in a card here. But otherwise, the most important thing is you have to be disciplined, you have to be a self-starter, and you have to be able to focus and communicate well. Remote work is already challenging enough from home. So doing it on travel and different time zones is going to push you. That's why working up to it in small incremental steps will be beneficial. So don't do like a two or three month long trip for your first trip. <laughs> Work up to it. Maybe just a weekend, half a week, one week, one week and a half, and then so forth. Just keep incrementally increasing it and getting confidence with your ability to survive different things that go wrong. And things will go wrong. If things do go wrong and things go out of control, hopefully the end of your trip is nearby and not too much bad stuff happens, especially when you don't wanna risk losing performance at your job. What's interesting is I've gone on trips and I've communicated even as a manager to my team that I'm gonna be going on a trip and sometimes it can be a month or two months and because I had a remote team anyways, it didn't really affect anyone. And for the most part, everyone, by time, the two month period was done and I got back, everyone forgot I was actually on the trip. So if this happens to you, you're doing your trip well. It has impacted your fellow coworkers exactly zero. All right, let's touch up a little bit more of how to balance that work and travel experience because that's the thing that a lot of people have the hardest time with. A lot of people, have a hard time just working at home because of the focus issue. But with all these things, they can be practiced and you can improve your ability to focus anywhere. And so actually that's a skill set I mentioned in another video, which I'll link in a card. So feel free to check that out. And I go in a lot more detail there. But having the ability to focus on demand as a skill will help you be able to be successful in travel more with minimal impact to your employer. But with that said, it's important to note that this kind of lifestyle of traveling while working full time doesn't mean you need to travel in a traditional way. The traditional way in America, not necessarily Europe. You've got to think more like a European travel. In a way, I'm going to travel slow. I'm going to enjoy the culture more. I'm going to book a ticket to Italy for two months and I'm going to see the whole country. By the way, if you're having difficulties planning, I have another video talking about that and I'll link it in the card. But with that said, once you have a plan where you have kind of a nice hub and spoke model, how to navigate a country, you will be moving around the different hubs and be working at the same hours of your coworkers while trying to hit some of the spokes each day. So you don't have to do as much every single day. In fact, you can find a nice pace of doing stuff at a pace you're comfortable with. Because you're working, you're not rushed. You don't need to have like a two week vacation schedule. In fact, you don't even need vacation unless there are certain circumstances like maybe you want to do a full day tour or you want to do a 10 day hike or something like that while you're in a different country. Of course, it's gonna be hard to remote into your job while you're hiking or scuba diving or something like that. There are certain circumstances where you want to use your vacation time, but that can be planned. Otherwise, going and seeing Rome, different cities around Italy, no problem. You can do that from a nice hotel at a hub and just kind of see all the different sites around the city over a course of weeks, over a longer course of period than you would if you had a full day. This is just maintaining your energy balance. And if you've been good up to this point and following my suggestions, about trying to lock your career into that 40 hours and having the skills to lock it in 40 hours, but being a high value in person where you can do more in those 40 hours than most other employees, then you've been doing a good job. But if you haven't been doing a good job and your employer starts reaching out and you have a lot of busyness going on while you're working, then you'll have to start working with them to set some boundaries. Setting boundaries is something you'll have to do with your employer 
different employers and build that level of trust to make sure that you don't burn out. Most employers, if they hire you, they want to keep you. Despite what other people may tell you, hiring someone's a big investment for any company and they're investing into you. It's kind of like a relationship. You have a relationship with your employer and they have a relationship with you. And as long as it's mutually beneficial on both sides, things are good. So it's important to have an open dialogue and communication on both sides. With that said, I do recognize in the software industry in particular, there are things like on-call duty or DRI duty. It's a little bit harder to mitigate. And with those kind of things, you have to be a little bit more flexible. So if you do have an on-call week or something that you can't like reschedule, then it's important to just schedule less during that week. Maybe just stay at a hub. And of course, you're paying for a hotel for a whole week, but hey, you can go work at a coffee shop or enjoy some local things and embrace the culture in different ways in a more slower way, in a unique way than you probably could back home. But it gives you some options while still being on call and maybe being busy. But the important thing to recognize is it's going to be more stressful doing all this together. If you're overly stressed, it could cause an extreme amount of burnout or panic attacks or any number of psychological issues around overstress. It is also important to not just jump into this thing, is what I'm saying. You kind of, like going back to what I said earlier, work up to it. Don't be the person who books a, like a two month digital nomad trip as their first trip. That is just a bad idea. And you're probably not ready for it because you have to kind of work through a few failures and I'll maybe make a video on different kind of failures you could face in the future. But you gotta have to experience those things, figure them out, figure out what works for you. And then if it happens again, you'll have confidence and more in knowing you can succeed. In the worst case, it's a total failure. But hopefully your trip is not too much longer. You'll be going home and you can reset back at home. So with that being said, make sure you work up to it and experiment before you go to longer trips. All right, tell me if you came to this video and thought there's some kind of get rich quick scheme and you're sadly disappointed, let me know in the comments below. But what I hope the takeaway is that I hope you see a true genuine person in me trying to give advice to you in a way where I have practice building up to several month long trips. I have achieved a lot as a technical leader in my career and I know I wasn't born with any gifts or any kind of favors. I earned and I built the empire that I did knowing what I wanted out of it. I wanted to travel. This was at the heart of a lot of decisions I made to get here. And I truly believe that if you have the will, you can do it too. If you're doing this to any capacity or hoping to improve, let me know. I'd love to hear where you're at and your experience and how I might be able to help you in the future through more videos or content. And in this video, I talked a lot about travel being very stressful. I have a perfect video for you to check out next if you've had some stressful experiences and you want to be ready for traveling and being able to handle that extra stress without having a mental overload. It's a video on how to maintain a healthy mental health state as a digital nomad. Check it out here. Until next time.